and if you're on opiates and have opiate induced hyperalgesia and all the other things, or you're on Lupron and you gain 200 pounds and you're 19 years old, I mean, we really saw some traumatic things, I think, in those early years that thankfully we are getting away from. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of I Care Better Endometriosis Unplugged. I'm your host, Jandra Mueller. Today, we have the privilege of speaking with Stephanie Prendergast and Elizabeth Akindler, the co-founders of the Public Health and Rehab Center. With over 20 years of experience as physical therapists specializing in pelvic pain, they have established themselves as leading experts in the field. In this episode, Steph and Liz will shed light on the transformation in the understanding and treatment of endometriosis and pelvic pain, from the challenges faced in the past to the advancements in diagnosis and therapies, they offer a unique perspective on the changing landscape of endometriosis management. Hello. This is fun having you guys on this end of things and uh, very excited to interview both of you together. So I know who both of you are, but can you tell anybody listening, everybody listening, a little bit about who you are, uh, about PHRC. Can both of you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So I started um, in 2001 in pelvic health after being out of physical therapy school for a year. I was pretty disenchanted with regular physical therapy. It just wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And not to mention as a new grad, I think many people can relate that you don't feel like you know what you're doing, which is directly tied to job satisfaction. So about a year in, I saw an ad in the San Francisco Chronicle that said, pelvic floor physical therapist wanted will train. And I started stalking this phone number, um, trying to get myself in the door for an interview. And what I saw was in an interdisciplinary practice, there was a lot more that we could do as physical therapists that I had no idea. So all the patients in that particular practice had pelvic pain which is different, I think, than a lot of people's journeys who may get started with pelvic floor dysfunction and then perhaps narrow into pelvic pain. But the patients were my age. They could not sit down. They could not have sex. They couldn't do regular things that people at that age should be able to do. And so it was much more engaging for me to start to work in that demographic. And that is where I met Liz. Yeah. So um, I have a somewhat similar story. I began working in orthopedics right out of PT school and quickly realized that was not the setting that was going to um, provide me with enough job satisfaction, we'll say. And so I also went looking for another job, found a job listing on Craigslist when people used to look (laughs) for jobs on Craigslist. Very similar ad, um, you know, looking for a pelvic floor physical therapist will train And I was like, I don't even know what this is. I think I had a lecture about pelvic floor, something in PT school, no idea, never had an interest, but applied for the job. This is where Stephanie was working uh, at a urologist's office. I spent a day shadowing, I think, both him and her. And I was very interested. I, I, you know, the the stories that people were telling were quite compelling Um, and, uh, seemed like, you know, these uh, stuff and the urologists they were working for were really making a big impact on people's lives. And I thought, well, this is something I could really get behind. I think I could be interested in. So, you know, and that was um, almost 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> and that's how that's how we got started or that's how I got started. And, um, you know, definitely felt like this was something that I, I could actually um, make an impact. In. And it was definitely definitely more my speed than uh, outpatient orthopedic. Yeah. And I have the reverse story of both of you where I went through the standard thing, right? So after working that clinic, and did you see males, females, did you see endometriosis or what you now kind of predict as endometriosis? And what did that look like then being, yeah, 20 years ago or so? Liz and I have reflected Liz. back on this. I know. I think we may even say the same things, but I mean, looking back at that period of time, this was also before the opiate crisis in America. We were seeing men and women right off the bat. We were trained in pelvic pain on patients themselves. So our background was incredibly different because I just, now we know how unusual of an experience that was, but reflecting back on the medical management of these patients, again, most of them were on opiates because of the severity of their pain. 
And I think Liz can say for sure, we were not part of the conversation for endometriosis. If they came to us, it was typically because they had adjacent comorbidities such as pudendal neuralgia, vulvodynia. Obviously, a lot of people with endometriosis have pelvic pain, but they were definitely not sent there by whoever was managing their endometriosis. Yeah. And I think a lot of the, I mean, I can think of two or three women right off the bat that we, we saw during those years at that urologist's office. I think some of them were misdiagnosed with, they had endometriosis and also had all this pelvic pain and were maybe misdiagnosed with something like pudendal neuralgia, because that was really one of the primary diagnoses, diagnoses that we saw. Um, that was mm-hmm. kind of the specialty of the person we were working with. So I think back a lot of those women, i probably didn't have that. And we're just not managed correctly. Um, also, I mean, yeah, we weren't, like Steph said, we weren't part of that conversation. Um, there were a couple of endometriosis specialists in California at the time that were kind of taking the bulk of them. And that was, there was even some controversy around that too. Um, but definitely no one was having the conversations of, you know, ablation versus excision or anything like that, yeah. let alone like everything else that endometriosis can kind of contribute to, like, you know, GI symptoms, et cetera. No, there wasn't any conversation yeah. about that at the time. No. So moving from the urology practice and then creating PHRC, is, is this year year 17? Year 16? Okay. This will be 17. Going we started into, in yeah. 2006. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it st- started in San Francisco, first offices, right? And so did your patient population look somewhat different? And how was that progression of moving from a urology? Did you see different types of patients? Where Did you see more suspected endo? Yeah, I think over the years, we definitely started seeing more endometriosis. I think just naturally, because we came from a urologist's office, we were seeing primarily pain and even more specifically neuropathic pain. So we just, that's kind of how we built our reputation. Steph and I were also teaching the continuing education course about pudendal neuralgia. So we, that was kind of where we started. But um, I would say, I mean, within probably the, you know, five years, we started to see a much, you know, larger kind of group of people and endometriosis or folks with endometriosis have definitely been increasing, I would say, in our offices. I would say even probably more so in the last maybe five to seven years, there's been a dramatic increase, just because I think there's better awareness uh, about treatment. But um, it was, I think, more of a gradual, a gradual increase. And I would add to that to say that our, our, what we did learn in the interdisciplinary setting is how important that actually is. And so one of the things that Liz and I really took on is like helping our patients manage their cases, even though we weren't in an interdisciplinary setting anymore. And then teaching courses also helped us to stay current on the literature to really be kind of helping the patients get the best care that they could while also supporting the field of physical therapy because there just wasn't enough information about how pelvic floor PTs even can treat pelvic pain. And Mm -hmm. endometriosis falls into that. Um, And so it was an interesting time for us because we were starting the practice, which is the business side, the the course, treating the patients and really just seeing how this field has continued to evolve. In the evolution of pelvic pain, and we now have many centers uh, in of PHRC, both East Coast and West Coast. Was there a turning point in the management of this or the awareness of this? What, what did you see as far as treatment? What did treatment look like back then as far as somebody that with suspected endometriosis or maybe came post-operative versus now? And can you talk a little bit about just the change over the last, you know, 10, 15 years? Gosh, I think the biggest change is the, you know, Um, awareness of how important excision surgery is versus ablation. You know, I think that's really made a huge difference in, you know, treating endometriosis, you know, um, more comprehensively. I think, you know, that a lot of, a, a lot of young women weren't even having surgery or having multiple surgeries. I mean, it was not uncommon, you know, even 
15 years ago to have a patient who had had four or five different laparoscopies to treat endometriosis. Certainly it was ablation um, that was yeah. done, I would imagine. Um, and so it's not, it's only been in the last, you know, five, seven years where there's been a real push for excision therapy and our excision, excision surgery. So I think that's, I, in my opinion, I think that's the biggest change in that I've seen and then how to support that, you know, and then also how to get yeah. people to those providers that offer that. And that's been, I think, probably, you know, maybe one of our challenges as, you know, people that are involved in like the overall care um, is just guiding patients to those folks. Mm -hmm. I agree with that entirely. And I think it really has been the most dramatic change in the last few years. And I mean, even your involvement, Jandra, with the course that you're creating, I mean, you're doing the same thing that we did with pudendal neuralgia. There's a whole need for it. And physical therapy can play a huge role for people, but most people don't even know that that could be part of their treatment plan. And to speak to Liz's point about excision versus ablation, we've got to add in the third category where people just had a biopsy and thought they had a therapeutic surgery. And that was something we saw all the time. So yeah. now when we're discussing multiple surgeries, they may or may not have been therapeutic. And if you're on opiates and have opiate induced hyperalgesia and all the other things, or you're on Lupron and you gain 200 pounds and you're 19 years old. I mean, we really mm -hmm. saw some traumatic things, I think, in those early years that thankfully we are getting away from. Yes. It's interesting because obviously I haven't been in the field as long as you, you both have, but one big turning point or observation I noticed is initially when I started and this was a conversation, it, it was a little bit easier to understand, like, do they need more care, another surgery? Because it was just, did you go to somebody who did ablation or excision? And pretty much if you said, I do excision, you kind of, that came with the whole gamut of I'm looking everywhere. I know all the different types of lesions. And now I have noticed, and I don't know necessarily how true this is, but maybe you both have noticed it too in, in the areas that your offices are. But now it's almost like everybody says that they do excision and you have, how do you like get down to the details? What did that look like? Was it all types of tissue? Was it just a biopsy? Was it a couple biopsies? And I think that's been a harder thing to navigate, especially as PTs, trying to understand prognosis. Sure. Yeah. Right. Because I think the other thing is, is um, amongst surgeons who do excision therapy, there's all different levels of comfortability of how complete or comprehensive they're mm -hmm. going to excise tissue, right? And, and their level of comfort, you know, and again, speaking, obviously we're not surgeons, but, you know, having had a lot of interaction with those, you know, providers, some people are more comfortable removing lesions from the bladder than other people, right? And they're yeah. going to, they may see it and leave it because they're not comfortable with that sort. Of, so yeah, I think that's a challenge as PTs, right? Is we, mm -hmm. we, we don't necessarily know we're not in the OR with them. Um, and we don't know just how much was left, if yeah. there was, right, or, you know, how, how complete or comprehensive the excision was. So that's, uh, that's a continued challenge, I mean, and for I sure. I think you're really speaking to the differential diagnosis that we can really help play a role in, like, because there's always a question in patients' minds, I don't feel well. Did they not do the right surgery? Was it not enough? Or are there other pain generators that need to be considered? And I really think that's yeah. where physical therapy can play the biggest role. Yeah. Agreed. Because we get them, you know, some doctors make them come, you know, long before to get that under control. Some people, we may not see them until they're already done with surgery. Some come right after, some come a year later. And so it makes it hard because these symptoms present very similarly to just pelvic pain in general or these other like overlapping pain syndromes. Perfect time to talk about what does, what does a good pelvic PT session look like? And with specifically somebody with endo? What, or what should it look like, I guess I should say? I think their history is really important. And also to understand, which we now know are called the chronic overlapping pain conditions. I think that people with endo may be diagnosed with seven different things. <laughs> Interstitial cystitis, pelvic floor dysfunction, pudendal, vulvodynia, endo, SIBO. And I think it's a good opportunity to really try to take their symptoms and tie together the fact that these may not be seven different diagnoses, but also, you know, symptoms of a bigger picture of what's going on. 
I think that's one of the most important parts starting at the beginning. And then obviously we are manual therapists, but there's room for pain science education too. And I think it's important to one to identify the somatic impairments, you know, and that can take up to four visits sometimes, even with an hour long appointment to really examine the tissues that are most related to the symptoms that they're explaining is the most bothersome to them. And that is going to be different for every single endometriosis patient. Sometimes it's the bladder symptoms. Sometimes it's a gut. Sometimes it's painful sex. But I think what we really focus on at PHRC is taking those impairments and creating an assessment. We got to look at their history, the physical findings, and create short-term goals to address the impairments that are going to help somebody get to their long-term functional goals. And that can take a long time for certain people or maybe six months for others, best case scenario. But I think that people with endometriosis are suffering with a lot of different things that also we need to help medically manage and get them to the right people if they don't have it yet. Yeah. Right, I think that's a good point. I think also really differentiating what we can actually help with and what we can't. You know, um, we were one person of a multi, you know, multidisciplinary team. And so really being up front, with that patient and saying, you know, you have all of these, you know, these various symptoms, here are the impairments that I know I can treat. And I think, you know, and linking them to particular symptoms. And so it's clear what we think we can gain with manual therapy versus what you're going to get from your excision therapy, maybe what you're going to get from working with whomever's helping you treat GI symptoms, if that's an issue. Um, Because, you know, obviously we can't treat everything. And I think there's somewhat of a misconception um, because thankfully there's been a lot of interest in physical therapy for folks with endometriosis, which is great, but, you know, we we can't treat everything either. So I think that's really important (laughs) is to make that distinction that this is what we can help you with. These are the expectations. And then what, and just kind of piggybacking on what Steph said is really helping them get to those other providers to treat those other symptoms. You know, we tend as pelvic floor therapists, I think we tend to be pretty well dialed in to a community that treats some of these things, maybe getting them to a GI person that has experience with, you know, these particular symptoms, or maybe to a mental health therapist that really focuses on, you know, chronic pain or whatever it is, we can really help them um, get to those, get to the right providers. Because I think that's a common, you know, I I think struggle for women that struggle with um, endometriosis. It's, you know, there's, there's a lot of cooks in their kitchen, and they've been burned by providers. So kind of helping them streamline that. Right. Because how many times do we see somebody coming in and they've, how many doctors have they been to? But then seven to 10 years average diagnosis. Sometimes it's 20 or 30 years and you're like, so has anyone talked to you about this? And that just creates a whole mess of its own. And we kind of assume, right, that they have pelvic floor dysfunction, whether it's directly as a cause or just delay and all these things happening to them over the years or assuming, like, I've been to urologists, I've done this, but we oftentimes can't assume that they've been to the right doctor, they've done the right treatments. And so we have to ask a lot of questions for that and and then say, oh, let's go here instead. And it has to be this doctor. And that that's really hard. And I think, I know in my experience, some patients have, have expressed a lot of frustration and anger after seeing like one of these providers that then they're like, how did this get missed? And I think it's really valid that they're angry and frustrated about that. Sure. Definitely have yeah. every right to be angry. And sometimes at us when we're suggesting things that they've already done, but we all in this chat here know it's strategy and sequence. And yeah. if there's very active endometriosis without the excision, you know, other therapies may not be helpful for that person until we get certain things cleared. And so sometimes we do have to revisit what they've already done. And it's never, yeah. you know, and keeping in mind patient fatigue from all of this, it is, it can be a full-time job. Yes. So I know when I came to PHRC, I was in Hawaii at the time and I had taken in PT school a course to better learn this because I also had and maybe a two-hour lecture elective. And, but I remember thinking like, there's something that I'm not, that I'm missing that I don't know that I don't know. I didn't know what that was. I just knew something wasn't making sense. And my experience coming to PHRC was like, whoa, all of these questions that I like was thinking or didn't even know I had like this now makes sense. And it really was the addition of pain education as far as pelvic pain goes 
and the addition of the knowledge around sexual medicine. So we Mm -hmm. see a lot of people on forums and talking about, I've already tried that. There's a difference, right? It's not everyone is sort of the same. And similar to the fact that we do not have a standard training or expectations for surgeons, PTs don't have that as well, though there are some criteria like the Women's uh, Health Certified Specialist or um, APTA has their pelvic ones. But it still doesn't really address pain and there's no standardization. So can you speak to the fact that all public PT isn't necessarily the same and why somebody may really seek out somebody that's experienced in pain and what that means and how that looks differently? I mean, this is a really, really big conversation, right? Because there's so many factors. A, you know, you're just not getting any of this training in, in grad school. You know, it just doesn't exist. You really have to seek out the information on your own. So I think for pelvic therapists, it really depends on, you know, what your experience was, like what sort of setting are you in, in, you know, in treating pelvic, you know, what are you exposed to? You know, if your population is 80%, you know, peripartum patients, then your experience and exposure and, and, and skill level with a pain population, you know, this type of pain is going to be minimal and, and you, you have to, you know, you have to have the experience to learn. And also, you know, who are your mentors? Who else is in the office? Are you the only pelvic, you know, person in whatever office you're treating? And if that's the case, it's really hard to learn. I think, you know, that was one of the things that really helped Steph and I kind of develop all of this is we had one another to bounce ideas off of, you know, and we were, we could always go to the other person and say, here's this case. I don't, you know, what do you think about this? And we could, you know, not only learn from one another, but we could practice things on one another. Right. I mean, we actually had each other. And the other big thing I think that's been different with Steph and I is we've, we've, we started in a setting that had a physician. And so we really sought out educational opportunities that were mostly physicians, you know, and we were sometimes the only physician in the room because of the type of career that we were in and felt like we were in. Um, and so I think being in that environment and carrying and continuing that education throughout our careers has really helped to build our confidence. And so yeah. I know that we probably have a lot more resilience and we have something to offer to each other than we did when we were in grad school. So there's a little Mm-hmm. Yeah, sexual medicine. It's just there's more to it than that, right? Yeah. And again, we prioritized that for our careers, and then we therefore turned around and did that for the company. And so, even right. if the staff isn't able to go to all the conferences, we have people like you and other leadership where we can bring this information in. And just so many physical therapists, unfortunately, do not have access to that. And then to speak to another level, they also may not be a good fit personality wise. And so we really want to encourage people not to give up if the first physical therapist wasn't a good fit, whether it was in terms of progress of their physical symptoms or in terms of personality. And thankfully, I think what Liz and I have both seen is in the recent years, there's more and more people coming into this field, but there's still more patients than providers. But I mean, yes. we are getting students in PT school taking Herman and Wallace classes and then applying for positions at the company, which I think is fantastic. But there's just a lot to do and we wanna help advocate for the patients and the PTs and just get everything yeah. to a better place. So for any PTs that are listening out there, um, <laughs> I, I do feel like some people come in like a little nervous, like, well, I should gain experience first. For those PTs listening, what what would you say? Is it is there a t- should they do education before coming into pelvic pain or pelvic health? Do you find it's helpful? Do you find it it's fine either way? I mean, definitely, if you can have some exposure, you know, before um, getting a job in this, yeah, I think any of it's helpful for sure. It's not enough by any means, you know, taking a few weekend courses is is not sufficient to treat this population by any means, but sure, just to learn some of the, you know, some of the nomenclature, right? Some of the, just the diagnoses and some of the terms around it, I think is helpful. Um, But I think my advice to anybody that wants to get involved in, in pelvic health is, 
your first job, you really have to have a good mentor or a good Mm -hmm. situation where you have some sort of mentorship, some sort of support, continued education, because without that, I think it's very difficult to become really uh, proficient, uh, especially treating, you know, complex pain like endometriosis. I mean, that's, you're not getting that in a weekend, you know, beginner course. (laughs) No. And And you're just going to get burnt out. (laughs) And things like this Sorry. podcast and the other podcasts. So there's a lot of free education available now from experts because it's really helping people around the board. There's YouTube and social media and just places that weren't available when Liz and I were answering Craigslist and ads in the paper. Yeah. You know, that's just right. why we did social media wasn't even a thing when we right. started. So we had books and phone calls and as Liz said, yeah. each other. But now I think there's more for people. You know, you do it in the car, you know, or just yep. put on a podcast and clean your house or whatever people need to do. Yep. Much more efficient than reading a book, although I love still reading books just the time, right? It's much, I can gain more from an hour podcast than half the time in a book sometimes these days. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I think you hit on some of the other questions, just talking about some of the challenges of treating this population. I want to hone in on particularly this whole uh, endometriosis and IC diagnosis, because it's probably, I know, at least for me, one of the more complex situations is is identifying and really honing in on the urinary symptoms, because there's so many different reasons. And it's probably one of the number one things that I see getting missed, whether they come in with a diagnosis of IC, painful bladder syndrome, or they just suspect it. Um, Thoughts on that from what we know now and, and maybe even what you saw before and how it was treated and what you're seeing now. According to the 2022 guidelines from the AUA, I mean, interstitial cystitis is a clinical diagnosis of exclusion. Rule out infection and you've got irritated bladder symptoms. Now you have IC. Now, you know, I get super worked up about this diagnosis because there are phenotypes and nine of them that are well documented. And so it's a misnomer to actually call it interstitial cystitis if people have irritated bladder symptoms because of endometriosis or because of pelvic floor dysfunction or because of hormone deficiencies. And people with endometriosis often have all three. And I think that the diagnosis is scary to patients. It's one of them that seems to be the scariest. In my clinical experience, listening to patients, they think that they're going to need to know where every bathroom is everywhere they go for the rest of their lives. And that is not simply what we see with clinical experience. And I, I mean, I think Liz can speak to this too and can take the second half of, of how we handle it, but there's reasons. Yeah. I mean, the progression or evolution of IC in the last 20 years has, has been really dramatic as well. Um, I think it was way overdiagnosed. We know so much more about it now, um, like Steph just mentioned. Um, so I think it's it's that is an interesting challenge because you you definitely see folks come in with that diet some and sometimes it's like almost as you know as the physicians walking out the door oh maybe you have IC see you later and then of course now with social media or just like just the internet and everything that comes with it right people immediately go to Google that and it's terrifying because a lot of the information out there does not seem very hopeful, right? But I think it's a misdiagnosis very often. um, And we just were missing the other components. A huge one is obviously, you know, hormonal um, insufficiency. That was was a really big miss that Steph and I did not have in the first half of our careers, or Mm -hmm. maybe even more, you know, what just wasn't addressed. So I think that's, that's, that's a really big component. Um, and I think sometimes it's hard to, um, kind of explain that to patients if they've had that diagnosis for 10 or 15 years, it feels like it's part of their almost identity. And sometimes it's hard to explain that, um, and that we've learned more. And again, another reason to stay up on all of the, you know, the medical stuff, right? Like to know, like in 2022, like there were actually new guidelines put out, you know, by the AUA uh, about IC and you have to, you know, stay up on that so you can educate your patients better. So if they, you know, maybe they would be open to um, trying hormonal supplementation if that's indeed um, indicated and, you know, that we really think might be treating their their, um, uh, IC or painful bladder syndromes or like, 
having a laparoscopic procedure if they have endometriosis. So yeah, I think yeah. that's a that's a really complicated um, kind of. I wouldn't even call it a comorbidity because I think it's often just missed the same thing. Yeah, agreed. And you know, to speak to yeah. the patient experience, they've got these symptoms. They go to the urologist. That urologist may never even ask them if they have dysmenorrhea. And the general urologist and even experts in IC are not thinking about this overlap that we know is so ingrained between these symptoms. And so you really got to understand what they've been through trying to, to understand this. And this is, again, where I think physical therapy can come in, podcasts like yours to really like lay this out there, because I, I guarantee a number of patients are going to listen to this and be like, yes, that was me. Yeah. We see it every day in our clinics. Right. Because the symptoms, frequency, urgency, or UTI-like symptoms, or, or some pain, right, those are so general and vague. And the first thing I always ask and think about is first-line therapies, hormonal suppression. So, of course, you know, no one's talking about that. Um, but then on top of that, you have the nine phenotypes. Is it infection? Is it irritation? Is it dietary, behavioral, nervous system? Like, so many of those things. But when 90% of the stibulodynia is hormonally mediated and that first line therapies for <laughs> endo are OCPs. It just makes sense. And, you know, nobody's really asking or treating that or looking at the vulva, even the gynecologist, like, as you know, they're really going in and going beyond the tissue and just looking at the cervix and making sure you don't have cancer and, you know, all of that. And so how many people could have looked at this and then did it? Exactly. And Sandra, I'm oh, sorry. But to the point of a conversation you and I had last week, Jandra, is like knowing if some people may have to go on these hormone suppressive therapies, maybe they cannot see an excision therapist, and knowing that they're going to cause GSM, which is a genitourinary syndrome of menopause, why can't we preemptively start to treat that with safe, local, vaginal therapies and hormones? And right now, we don't see that yet as part of the treatment yeah. plan, because the endo people are not the sex med people. And- mm -hmm. I see you bridging the gap. We really need to, because what if we could help keep them more functional, even though they have to take this horrible drug? Right. Yeah. Right. Many gynecologists are not looking at a, you know, 18 year old thinking GSM, right? I, even, with, even with a history of OCPs, right? Because they're not looking at the tissues for those sometimes very obvious signs of, of, you know, hormonal insufficiencies, because, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the people that are suffering with endometriosis are that 16 to, you know, 30, well within the premenopausal right. age, right? So yep. it's just not on their, their minds to really be looking at that. And I think that's going to be a shift, right? Hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, soon that, I mean, it really needs to change with the training of gynecologists, which is, you know, I'm, I'm, I know that doesn't happen quickly by any means, but podcasts like yours and there's other urologists and gynecologists that are talking about this, you know, that's definitely going to help. And hopefully it's just on their brains to maybe take the five seconds to just check out their, yeah. you know, vulva and see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, do you, either of you have like a particular story or experience that really stands out to you, positive or negative? something you wish you would have done different or knew different or just had a great experience with somebody that you want to share? I mean, I said it already, but I think that the form, what we've learned about hormones in the last five to seven years has completely changed our practice. Yeah. I mean, I can think of at least a half a dozen, if not a dozen women from before that time and thinking, oh, what they what they needed was hormonal supplementation. And that's why what we were doing, you know, manual therapy wasn't effective, you know, I mean, so yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing. I, I think that's one of the biggest things in our, in our, in my career that has changed my practice significantly. So yeah, I mean, and now there's tons of great stories, you know, of, of a woman, you know, coming in with dyspareunia, maybe penetrative dyspareunia that is a newly onset thing, and she's menopausal and it just happened. You look at her vulva, she's got tons of signs of, um, you know, hormonal insufficiencies. You say, you don't need me. You need to go get, you know, some supplement hormones. She checks back in with you in, you know, 10, 12 weeks. She's like, yeah, it's completely gone. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those are amazing stories, right? That, and then I didn't do anything except tell her to go back to her gynecologist and you yeah. know, get some hormone su supplementation. But those are great stories, right? Because it's, it's really yeah. quite simple. 
you know, 10, 15 years ago, that was not a conversation I was having. Yeah. No. Probably frustrating on your part too, as a provider. Well, we're just thinking, what are we doing wrong? You know, and and as PTs who aren't aware of some of this information, you know, they think it's them. They're not doing the right treatment. They're not doing the right manual therapy. They're not doing something right, but really they may not have the full story. And so I do agree with Liz. It was, it was shocking when we did get in the know and how much the practice changed because of it. And then to speak to that with endometriosis, I mean, in those early, I'd say my first 15 years, I had no idea that the bladder could be a component. I mean, there were a few papers where they were calling it the evil triplets with like IC vulvodynia and endo, but nobody was really making the connection that I think we've seen in the last few years about it, like, you know, really just manifesting in all these different ways. And with that, I think patients are getting much better, but I can definitely think of several times, you know, around 2008, 2010, patient came back to me and was like, I have endometriosis. And when I had surgery, like my bladder symptoms went away and I, it stands out to me because she also would like send me very nice ceramic pots or something. And I was literally doing nothing to help her. And then for then it to be said that she has endometriosis in my head, I was like, but you don't have terrible dysmenorrhea like and so my limited knowledge has really expanded and i think this is going to be good for patients across the board we know that this is underreported and that it is probably more prevalent than one in 11 and i think the more that this information continues to grow and watching other countries make it a priority too hopefully america is going to get its act together and step up a bit yeah australia and the uk have I've I've more recently learned about some of the differences in their mm-hmm. training and, you know, just way more advanced than we are, way more on top of the standardization. Uh, listening to Dr. McKenzie's um, little event, you know, they brought in a speaker and just to look at the standardization of those that are endo experts or specialists, that's really hard. That's, those are controversial terms in the U.S. right now because who, it's all self-proclaimed, right? Like we can talk about excision, but really there's nobody at at that level looking at that. And so to see what they're doing, it's kind of infuriating. Yeah, no, I hear you. And I agree. So it's got to get better. Yeah. <clears throat> well, what do you, if there's one last thing you think is important for either patients to hear or PTs looking into this field, any any thoughts or advice? I think patients should never give up. I think, again, as I mentioned, strategy sequence and provider choices are always options, hopefully, that they can find the right fit for them. For PTs and everybody else, listen to your podcast and join our company. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have 11. You. We're here to help you learn. <laughs> and Liz Neela would probably say something like that, so I'll let her be a little more objective. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think for patients, you know, um, I think it's really frustrating. We've kind of touched on this when you when you see a provider that's that either just isn't really interested in this like subspecialty within like, you know, maybe the gynecology world or they just don't have a lot of education or awareness. Um, there are people out there that can help you. So so really, you have to seek out those providers that are interested, that have experience in, you know, in it, whether it's endometriosis or pelvic pain or pelvic symptoms in general. So really seek out those people. Um, and the same with PTs too, you know, pelvic health therapists, there's, there's variation within our own little, you know, subspecialty. There are some therapists that really focus on more, you know, whether it's pregnancy or incontinence, and there's some that really focus more on pain. If you have a pain diagnosis, make sure that you see that therapist that really has that as a specialty and, and is comfortable, you know, seeing that population. Um, and as PTs, I think I'll just reiterate what I said before. If you want to get into this field, you got to have a good mentor. You have to have a good educational program. Going to weekend courses is just not enough. It doesn't expose you enough to the things that you need to know. And as Steph mentioned, you know, that was a big, um, I mean, that was one of our main goals in starting this company was to have a place where we'd have a community of pelvic therapists to learn off each other and, you know, and, you know, and 
to learn off people who had a sub, even a specialty within public health, like you, Jandra, you know, whenever there's an endo question within the company of whatever we, you know, 20 therapists or whatever, you get those questions. And we all, you know, a lot of us have these little subspecialties, mm-hmm. which makes us, you know, a really huge, we have a huge wealth of knowledge amongst us all. And, you know, that's why, you know, when therapists come to work for us, I think they, they often ask what classes should I take and everything. And it's like, mm, just, just work with us for a few months. And then you can see And most of the time they're like, oh my gosh, thank goodness I didn't take those beginner courses. That was week one mm-hmm. of the HRC, you know? Yep. And I now I feel like I could teach that course. So I think just having a good group of mentors or at least just one mentor is, is just so necessary. So necessary. Yeah. Well, on that note, do you believe we are hiring in some locations? We have 11. And as a PT who's now half my career, more than half of my career has been with PHRC. I I can speak to these things. It was life-changing in the amount of knowledge that I got that I couldn't and didn't find anywhere else. But not just the education piece, but even the networking and and having resources to find those specialists, whether it's a urologist with sexual medicine or a gynecologist that really focused on pelvic pain. It was really nice to in some ways have a lot of that at least handed like the foundation and then build upon that. So yeah, um, I think, I think it's fine to say that we're hiring and you can find uh, more information on our website, pelvicpainrehab.com. It will be in the show notes and we encourage everyone to check out our website and our social media handles, which will also be in the notes. Thank you, Jandra. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jandra. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Endo Unplugged, presented by I Care Better. We hope you found our discussion insightful and empowering. Remember, you are not alone in your journey with endometriosis. Together, we can raise awareness, support one another, and drive positive change in the understanding and management of this condition. Tune in weekly to I Care Better Endo Unplugged for more inspiring conversations, expert insights, and practical tips to help you navigate life with endometriosis. If you have any questions, suggestions, or personal stories you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us on our website, iCareBetter.com, or social media platforms, at iCareBetter. And let's continue this conversation. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Together, we can make a difference for those living with endometriosis. Endometriosis.